Hello, and welcome to Health Discovered, the show dedicated to taking on important topics and discussing what they mean for your health. I'm WebMD producer, Kat Carney. Normally, I'm behind the scenes at Health Discovered, but today I'm stepping behind the microphone. As always, our goal is to bring you fascinating stories and unique perspectives on health while looking for unexpected discoveries along the way. We'll also explore thought-provoking medical-related ideas and questions like this one. Has the COVID-19 pandemic caused me to lose my hair? I always had really great hair. It was part of my persona. It was big and curly, and I could just wake up, give it a couple brushes, and it was perfect. And now it was all gone. I saw it primarily when I looked in the mirror. I don't know where my hair goes. It's a little, <laughs> it's one of those mysteries. It's probably the same place where the odd socks end up. But... Um, it, it was pretty evident. Mine started probably about the second week of October, and I've lost approximately 75 to 80 percent of my hair so far. You're listening to people who all contracted and recovered from COVID-19 this past year, only to start seeing massive hair loss in the weeks following their recovery. Patients like Lynn Traxler, a disaster relief chaplain volunteer in North Carolina. I was hospitalized for nine days. I went into the hospital on July 31st of this year, and my hair loss didn't start then until October. So when you first started noticing that your hair was shedding, how did you notice it? Did you see it in the mirror? Did you see it in a brush? Actually, I noticed it more in the shower. I took a shower, and I just had just such a large amount of hair loss. And then when I brushed it out, it was so much more than that. So I knew something was not right. It was just coming out by the handfuls. Well, you can see how thin mine is. Can you see that? How thick was it before? Oh, extremely thick. I've always had very, very, very thick hair. And so when I say I've lost about 75, 80%, this side is all I've got is fuzz on this side from my ear forward. And it's getting that way on this side. So I've lost a lot. And Lynn is not alone. 700 miles away on July 31st, the exact same day she was hospitalized for COVID-19, Yolanda Vasquez, a family support worker for the YWCA in Palm Beach County, Florida, also fell critically ill from the virus. I was in real bad shape. I had double pneumonia, blood clots. I could barely stand. I couldn't eat. I just felt very weak. felt like I got hit by a baseball bat. How many days were you hospitalized? Eight days. So the first couple of weeks were rough. Around the third week, I started to be able to drive again, um, going to the doctor to get um, COVID tested to make sure that I no longer had the virus. Um, so it took about three weeks for me to get better. And just like Lynn Traxler up in North Carolina, it wasn't long before Yolanda's hair started falling out. How long after you tested positive for COVID did you start to notice hair shedding? I was sick from July 31st, 2021, all the way to August 25th with symptoms. Uh, September 9th was the last day I tested positive. So I started to notice hair shedding about a month after. So mid-October, which happened to be my birthday, and uh, I noticed I was trying to put my hair up in a ponytail and masses of hair were coming out of the brush and comb. I continued to put my hair up as normal. But um, when I pulled my hair down for the night, the next day, um, more came out and is from the front of my hair and more came out and more came out. And then I started getting really worried. I, I, I cried. Mine was pretty severe. I lost about 80% of my hair. Thankfully, my husband said, oh, you look fine. No worries. It's not a big deal. But, you know, he would see the buckets of hair that in the shower, in the garbage, all over the sink, on the floor, in the kitchen, in the vacuum, everywhere. I shed more than the dog. Both women wasted no time trying to find answers. And at what point did you reach out to your doctor about the hair shedding? That's continued for like two or three days. Then I just knew, okay, this is something really going on. So I did some research online. And once I found, oh, there is something called COVID hair, then I contacted my doctor. The dermatologist said, yes, we are seeing a number of patients coming in after COVID infection 
with hair loss. And this hair loss, or hair shedding to be more accurate, has a name, telogen effluvium. What is telogen effluvium? Telogen effluvium is the type of hair loss that occurs in the telogen phase. So there are different types of phases of the life cycle of a hair shaft, for example. And it just happens to be in this particular type of hair loss, it occurs in that telogen, which is actually more the resting phase of hair loss. That's Dr. Susan Masick, an associate professor of dermatology at the Ohio State University Medical Center. Is telogen effluvium a serious condition? It depends on how you want to define serious. So when you look at it purely from a medical standpoint, it is not a serious condition. It is something that is temporary. It's uh, not um, uh, permanent, so it's a temporary condition. It's reversible, so the hair will come back. Uh, typically, patients don't have symptoms. It's not as if the scalp is painful. It's not burning. It's not um, scarring by any means. And so from that standpoint, it's actually a very benign condition medically. The important uh, aspect of telogen effluvium is that uh, there aren't actually symptoms associated with it. So that it really is just hair shedding. You'll see hair on the bathroom floor. You'll see hair in the shower drain, for example, or you run your hand through your hair and it'll be uh, coming out in handfuls in your hair. Now, you mentioned the different phases or stages of hair growth. Can you talk us through the cycle of hair there are three phases of hair. There's typically antigen phase, which 90% of the hairs of the scalp are in the antigen phase. Lasts usually about three to four years. There's also the catagen phase, which about one to 2% of hairs are in that catagen phase, which is the transition from antigen, which is the growth phase, to the resting phase. Usually lasts about three to six weeks, so it's not a very long period. And then hairs transition to the telogen phase, which is that resting period. Typically about 10% of the scalp hairs are in the telogen phase, uh, and that can last for several months, usually about three to four months. With telogen effluvium specifically, what happens is the hairs that are normally in the antigen phase, which is the majority of our hair uh, on our scalp, transitions quickly due to a, some particular triggering event into that telogen phase, and those hairs shed, which causes that telogen effluvium. That's typically uh, the more common type of hair loss that you'll see with some type of triggering event, inciting event, and in the case today that we're talking about with COVID-19. Let's focus on triggering events. We've been living with the pandemic now for about 19 plus months. We're good, getting ready to go into what some people say might be another surge. But at what point did you in your practice start hearing patients coming in saying, I'm losing more hair than I think I should? Telogen effluvium usually occurs about three to four months after some type of inciting event or triggering event. So in the case of COVID-19, we were seeing it more probably about six months into the pandemic because uh, typically there's that lag time between uh, an actual infection and then the development of the telogen effluvium. So usually about three months or so after um, a COVID-19 infection, for example, we're talking COVID-19, fairly severe infections where patients have had high fevers or maybe they've needed hospitalization. You said that you and your colleagues noticed an increase in hair loss in patients coming in who had an official COVID-19 diagnosis, but is the hair loss they were experiencing specific to COVID-19 or could that have happened with any type of similar infection? That's a very good question. Telogen effluvium is not necessarily unique just a COVID-19 infection. We actually have been studying telogen effluvium for years and years. So dermatologists are very familiar with this condition because it can be any type of uh, physiologic stressor. So it doesn't even have to be a, a hospitalization, for example, but it can be a high fever from some other condition. You can develop pneumonia and have it not necessarily be related to COVID-19. So the in terms of the, the medical stressors, it could be um, fevers. It could be um, things such as a surgical uh, uh, event or an emergency like a heart attack. We also have seen it in um, patients after, uh, for example, a pregnancy. We've also seen it with patients who've gone through other type of medical emergencies. We've also seen it in patients, unfortunately, who do things like crash diets where they're suddenly uh, changing their diet drastically and will have a sudden weight loss. And that can be enough of an inciting factor to cause that telogen effluvium. Would it be safe to say that telogen effluvium is a response to 
something that someone has recovered from or gone through as opposed to an earmark of there's something wrong with me right now? That's exactly right. That There's that lag time. So patients will come in and say, gosh, it's so strange. I'm, I'm losing all this hair all of a sudden. And we say, oh, what was happening about two to three months prior? It is a response to um, a situation, whether it's a medical condition, whether it's a COVID-19 infection, whether it's the stress related to it. So it's actually an indication of um, what was happening in your health several months prior. It's not an acute situation in which you're having this hair loss and suddenly you need to have this huge workup or you need to go um, run to the doctor and make sure there's no other underlying medical condition. But not everyone recovering from infection or a stressful event will experience telogen effluvium, or TE. So it's not across the board that everybody that has had COVID-19 or has tested positive with COVID-19 will develop telogen effluvium. But there are enough patients that we're seeing that correlation where they said, yes, I had a severe case or I had high fevers associated with it. On the other hand, the other type of trigger uh, triggering event is actually the stress that can be related to whatever it happens to be. So in this case, we're actually also seeing patients that have had a lot of stressors, which the pandemic in general has been a hugely stressful event for many of us, whether it's uh, working from home or remotely, um, small business owners that are struggling financially, um, moms and dads who are working at home and have actually having to teach their kids remotely last year in particular. So we're, see we're seeing folks that were coming in that didn't necessarily have the official COVID-19 infection, but we're really struggling with the stress related to that. And so as time has gone on through the pandemic, they'll say, by the way, I've noticed more hair shedding. Michelle Anderson, a professional speaker from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is one of those who thankfully evaded COVID-19 infection, but experienced hair shedding as a result of pandemic stress. We've been in the pandemic now for about 19 months. At what point did you start to notice, wait a minute, I'm losing hair? I would say a good six months into it, maybe nine months, because honestly, I hadn't noticed it until I went to go see my stylist. And I had been avoiding that for a while based on the pandemic. And she was the one who said, you know, your hair is really thinning. She was familiar with uh, my my past as far as what my hair had looked like over, you know, probably the last five or six years. And she just gently commented, you know, honey, I think you might have a little bit of a problem here. You know, your hair looks a lot thinner than the last time I saw you. And, you know, just, just want to point that out. And I said, really, I, I didn't necessarily even believe her at that time, but she, she took the time to show me with pulling it out from the back and, and a mirror, definitely. And I noticed she did say she's seen it a lot with her, her clients during COVID. What was your response? Honestly, I was really surprised because I have always had thick hair. And uh, it, it was something new for me, but it also was something I knew I could attribute to stress on some level. And I consider myself to be somewhat of a high stress individual. And I know a lot of us are as, as any kind of working moms. And this COVID just made things a whole different level of stress. And it, it made sense. But it was also something I saw as, okay, we're going to conquer this. This isn't going to end. We were already going through pandemic stress. Now you mm -hmm. were losing your hair. Did that stress you out even more? Of course. You know, I'm only 40 years old. I think that it seems a little too early for that, if you ask me. I definitely was thinking about it too much. Then you start to notice it even more, too. I had never before thought it was really necessary to tie my hair back when I was cooking. And now, over the past year, I've really noticed if I don't, we're going to have a problem with that. <laughs> it's going to be a hair in the food. It's been one of those things that up till now, I, I really didn't want to talk about. But talking about hair loss with a medical professional is always beneficial, especially since the human body doesn't differentiate between pandemic stress and other stressors. I'm Dr. Aaron Milius, and I'm a board certified dermatologist right, right outside of Philadelphia. There is a lot of detective work I do backwards where I have to basically sit down and say, let's not talk about what happened last week when you first noticed your hair loss. Let's talk about three to six months ago. Tell me about that time period. 
And a lot of times people are sitting there kind of thinking, gosh, what did happen back then? I can't remember. Can people lose hair as a result of happy stress, like planning a wedding? Stress is stress, and it all depends on how you internalize your stress. I'd like to think of hair shedding in that case as almost being like a check engine light in your skin that tells you when you're dealing with a lot more than you can handle. So sure, there can be happy stress. Say, for example, moving into a new home. That's a wonderful stress. You've got this new home, something to look forward to. But if you are taking on a lot, you know, you're actually realizing you're doing much more than you anticipated. Planning a wedding does fall under that category. Absolutely, you can experience loss in those scenarios, but it really has a lot to do with how your body manifests that stress. But at what point did you start noticing an increase in patients coming to you saying, hey, doctor, I'm losing too much hair? It timed perfectly for when people started to come out again last summer. Shutdown started in March, and we could almost predict that it was going to start happening in about June or July because there's usually a three to four month delay before between the period of stress and the onset of shedding. It has a lot to do with the process that's occurring sort of at the microscopic level where our hair is actively growing, thinking of it as maybe about 80 to 90 percent of our hairs are actively growing in what we call the antigen or growth phase. But and only maybe 10 to 20 percent are in the resting phase or telogen phase. But when that sudden stress occurs, and again, it could be the physical stress of actually experiencing the illness or the emotional stress of the shutdown, then there's a delay where oftentimes a significant percentage of our hairs will enter the resting phase, but you won't actually see them falling out until three to four months later. And it's probably because there's a new hair growing in, pushing out the old, that you actually witness it occur. You and your colleagues kind of expected this, but I think a lot of people pretty much across the globe didn't expect to lose as much hair. What were they saying to you when they were coming to your office? There were a lot of fears as to what it could signify. You know, when you see your hair coming out in clumps, it can trigger an onset or chain of anxiety where we all tend to worry that hair loss could be a sign of something more worrisome going on. So there was a significant fear that this could be not just a temporary shedding, but an ongoing shedding. And that could be very scary for a lot of patients to understand. And it takes a lot of counseling, a lot of really going through the details of what to expect so that people understand what is going to happen next because the stress of hair loss will lead to more hair loss because that alone is another stress that can keep it ongoing. What are some of the things specifically that you would say to your patients? The key is understanding what's happening at the level of your hair follicles so that you don't really feel like things are out of control. Understanding the cycling that's occurring in hair growth is the most important thing. So I really take the time to sit down and say, you know, I go through those hair growth cycles. We all know that about 80 to 90 percent of our hairs are actively growing. 10 to 20 percent are in the resting phase at any point in time, sort of randomized through our scalp. You don't even know what's happening. We all lose maybe about 50 to 100 and 50 hairs a day naturally through the course of a day without realizing it or we're, we're sort of used to it. When that stress occurs, suddenly there's that shift into the resting phase where a lot of those actively growing hairs that were in the antigen phase turn into the telogen phase. We actually will find that it's great to always point out to patients what the experience is that they look at the end of those hairs that are coming out and they see a little white bulb at the end of the hair. That usually is an indication of what we call a telogen hair, which is by definition a stress-induced hair loss. Our hairs are pretty deeply rooted in the scalp, almost like a plant in a farm where those roots could run deep. They won't come out very quickly on their own immediately. They do require a push on the backside of the hair, that follicle entering the antigen phase again, which means there's an active growth happening underneath the surface, pushing out that old hair, and then you actually witness the loss occurring. So in so many ways, the shedding is actually the recovery phase. That's when we'll start to see new hair coming in and helping them understand there's a bell curve here. They might be on the upswing when they see us and feel like, oh my gosh, this is not ending anytime soon, but it will start to decline, gradually resolve, and then they'll see that new hair growing in, which is like peach fuzz, it's flyaway hair, untamable, fine hair that's just there, but it's hair and it will grow longer, grows like a blade of grass, starts off tapered on one end and gets wider and wider as it grows longer. And that's when you know you're entering into that recovery phase. That's really interesting. You said that they can look at the hair that's that's come out and they can look at the end of the hair. Describe that to me one more time, what, pe- what people are looking for. 
when you look at those hairs that are coming out on your hairbrush or in the drain or all over your sweaters and your clothing, you see it's a full length of hair. It's not broken in the middle. So it actually, you will see at the very end of the hair follicle, there will be this little whitish bulb. It's just a protuberance of the bulb there where it's not the same color as your hair, almost a gel-like whitish substance on the surface of it. And it takes on a club or, bel or bulb shape to it. People often do notice that. They'll actually comment and think that that's a worrisome finding. However, I tend to say, no, that's a good thing. That means that that hair came out at the root, which is okay, because that means there's a new hair coming in right behind it. Versus hair loss, you know, the antigen type of loss where it happens genetically over time, those hairs leave, leave the hair follicle in the growth phase. So they actually don't have that whitish bulb at the end. But when you see that white bulb, that should be a little bit more reassuring that you're in a phase of, of cycling changing more than anything else. I'm sure that will help a, a lot of people to feel like, okay, I'm seeing the white bulb. That means I'm, I'm on the upswing. Fred Retman, a retired business professor in Toronto, Canada, is on the upswing, but it's been a long road. Yes, I uh, contacted COVID in mid-April of this year and... After my recovery, I noticed I had a significant amount of hair shedding. Where were you seeing it? Were you noticing it when you looked in the mirror? Were you seeing it on your clothes? I contacted COVID in mid-April of 2021. I had a good two-week case. I was so sick, I didn't even understand how sick I was. Uh, I probably should have been in the hospital. Up until probably three weeks after I initially contacted the COVID, I really wasn't paying much attention to my personal grooming. Um, but when I had that one good shower and went to comb my hair, uh, I noticed there was a lot less than uh, I had when I first contacted the COVID. And it continued to shed for probably another month. Um, and then I guess, so that's about six weeks in that, um, that I shedded. And then uh, it sort of went dormant and... About a month ago, I noticed it was I was starting to get significant regrowth. And what was your reaction when you noticed the hair shedding? From a cosmetic view, not so much because I had already had a fair bit of balding. And I'm just devastatingly good looking to start with. So it's not that big a loss. But it, it's certainly not something you expect. You know, it's, it's a bit of an anomaly. And, uh, you know, people will come up to you and, what's different? What's different? Well... <laughs> You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Everything's different. But yeah, so I've lost a little hair. Big deal. It's taken about eight months for it to start to come back. Eight months can seem like a long time, but both doctors Ilias and Massick stress that hair growth is a very slow process. It's true. Watching hair grow is like watching water boil or grass grow. It is a slow process, but it is occurring. Ultimately, it has to go through its cycle. Is the best remedy time or is there anything that we can do in the interim once we know it's TE? That's a really good point. There's actually no specific treatment for telogen effluvium. It's time. It's the tincture of time. And that's oftentimes the hardest because we're wanting to find that solution. We're wanting to be proactive. And, and is there something that we can do to make this better? Can we make it go away faster? Can we get the hair to grow uh, uh, as quickly as possible? And so for all of those reasons, we really, really emphasize to patients, it is time that's going to be the most important component to TE and addressing TE. If you absolutely wanted to do something, you could consider using things off-label, such as minoxidil, which is found over the counter, just to try to trigger a faster growth phase. However, it's hard to say how effective these products may be. I've seen it happen again and again, and I've seen people spend a lot of money on a lot of false hope and false cures out there. You'll grow your hair, but the hair was going to grow back anyway. So it's just a matter of being patient more than anything else. But what about those gadgets, like those brushes with red lights and those helmets with blue lights? Oh, that's an interesting thought. So those types of products, um, you know, again, there's not a lot of studies on them to begin with. However, their main focus is focusing on a different type of hair loss. That would be more the true hair loss or the antigen type of hair loss, not the telogen. Those are really focused on the inflammation underneath the scalp that might be triggering some hair loss to occur. That wouldn't be the same process that's occurring in this stress-induced or telogen type of loss. 
there are a lot of supplements, quote unquote, hair growth supplements on the market. Are they worth trying? That's an interesting question that's that's a, uh, come into focus for uh, physicians because it used to be that we recommended biotin, which is a vitamin, a type of vitamin B, in fairly high doses. The issue, though, is that uh, it's been found that can interfere with blood tests that are typically done for heart attacks called troponin and also for uh, uh, blood tests that's typical for screening for thyroid diseases, TSH. So we're now telling patients, maybe we don't want to overdo it on the biotin. Biotin itself, uh, uh, less than 1,000 micrograms would be safe. But if we just, if you look at some of those hair and nail growth vitamins that are specifically targeting the biotins and the vitamin Bs, there may be too much of that biotin. So these days we're actually encouraging just a regular multivitamin will be fine. I see a lot of ads for different products saying, oh, grow a half an inch of hair a month. When the hair is in the growth phase, what would be the maximum length hair would grow in a month? Very minimal amount. I, I think sometimes those um, advertisements are, are really a little bit misleading. Uh, they're definitely over-promising uh, with regard to how effective those products are. But if you think about it, um, and people will see it oftentimes when they color their hair in, in a month, how, you know, how much is it? You know, maybe it's a few millimeters. It's not excessive in terms of an inch a month. I, I think some of that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a little unrealistic. But, but hair grows slowly. It grows very slowly. When we're looking for that regrowth, we're hoping that, okay, maybe in, a, in two months, I'm going to be back to where I was. And, and oftentimes we have to reassure patients, the hair's regrowing, it's coming back, but we're talking months, maybe even a year to two years. We're not even looking at max growth a quarter of an inch a month. I would say that would be a, an impressive amount of hair growth in, in a month. So we're, we're probably saying more, that would be more realistic over three months, uh, perhaps even uh, up to six months with regard to that length of hair in that short period of time. Can hair grow uh, up to an inch in a month? Probably not, but in an inch in three to four months, sure. Everybody listening to this podcast just had a collective Oh, no, <laughs> because we want to think there is something we can do to speed it up to at least a quarter of an inch a month. I think that that's what we really have to tell help patients with is making sure that they have um, the realistic timeline. So for a lot of times when we have patients come into the office, we tell them, we'll see you back in six months. And they say, six months, that seems like an awful long time. And the reason why we want to give it that length of time is that if we are going to see improvement, we're not going to see it month to month. That's essentially what Lynn Traxler heard from her dermatologist. Did she tell you how long it would take for it to grow back? It could be six months to a year before I had full growth back. Right now, are you still losing it? I thought two days ago that it was slowing down, and uh, I think now that maybe it has a little bit, but I also have so little hair left compared to what it was that I think it's a combination of I just don't have as much hair to lose as much, as well as it maybe slows down a little bit. Dr. Masick points out that telogen effluvium can take an emotional toll as well psychologically can have a huge impact on patients, especially for women that develop this condition, because so much of our self-identity, how we view ourselves, what we think is uh, beautiful or healthy, is, is, can be related to hair and how we style our hair. When you went to the dermatologist and finally had an answer for what was happening, tell me how you felt. Sad, because I thought that the worst was over, because some my whole family got COVID. I felt like I kind of beat that and I come back home and it's my birthday and I start losing my hair and I find out what it is. And I felt like COVID was the gift that just kept giving. When you got close to me, you could see my scalp. Um, I would run my hands through my hair and it would be just strands all over the place. Uh, the Me picking my hair through my hands and throwing it on the floor or throwing in the trash and it being all over my clothes. It literally seemed that I was going through a period of, or a little bit of what chemotherapy patients go through when they lose their hair. Cause it was so severe and so sudden that 
it was like, okay, um, I can deal with this. Let me just figure out a way to deal with this. It took me a couple of days. Um, I bought a topper from Amazon. I bought a couple of wigs. Um, those were really uncomfortable. I had to cover myself with a, a turban or a, um, a beanie or a bonnet. Um, cause I felt people were kept staring at the bald spots on my head instead of me being able to help the people that I'm service to help. Here I am worrying about, you know, this large patch on my head and covering it with root spray and hair fibers and trying to look as professional as possible in a professional environment. That people say, oh my God, what happened to your hair? It's all gone. Or I think that we can't downplay the emotional aspect of telogen effluvium because I think that's equally important when we try to look at a holistic uh, review of how a patient is doing, how they're feeling. So in the one sense, telogen effluvium is considered um, a short-lived event, a little blip in uh, patients' lives, but for many, it can have an impact in terms of how they're feeling during the telogen effluvium, because telogen effluvium it, the, itself can last for several months, and then you have to wait for all that hair to regrow, which can be several additional months or even a year or two years down the line. I decided to shave my own head and just let it grow back however it was going to grow back and took a little bit of talking to my family, to my friends, and thankfully to the support group that I found on Facebook because they were the real people that knew exactly what was going on. The Facebook group is called the COVID Hair Loss Support Group. That's Shelley Lime, a practicing hairdresser and consultant trichologist in the United Kingdom. She's also co-founder of the COVID Hair Loss Support Group. And when you started the Facebook group, how many people per week were joining? In the first week or so, it started like 100, 200, all of a sudden really rapidly 1,000. And we're now up to nearly 5,000 members. And what are some of the things they're saying when they're joining? 100% reaching out for emotional support. That's the key driver for most. Were you shocked by the number of people who joined the group? We have members from India, uh, members from America, uh, members from China. So so it's, it's a global thing. Um, yeah, some European Portuguese. Um, yeah, so all, all over the world, really, um, it seems to. And that, and that actually surprised me. Social media can be a little bit toxic at times. Um, and this is a time when I think it's actually worked completely in the reverse and brought lots of people together with with the common, you know, issue and complaint that we all want to see, um, you know, and help and support each other through. That's been absolutely a gift. Lynn Traxler happens to be an active member of the group. Thrilled, just beyond words thrilled. It's, it's I guess it's something that's so unique that we're just finding out it happens that uh, having somebody that knows what you're going through, what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, they understand it and you, they don't put you down for it. I check in with the group at least once a day, maybe more than that, just gleaning from their experiences, uh, the support, the encouragement. It just has been invaluable to me uh, as far as helping with the stress, just knowing somebody knows exactly where you're at. They're going through what you're going through. And sometimes, you know, you'll read posts and they'll just say, now calm down, it's going to be okay. Your hair is going to come back. Be patient. And it just helps so much to uh, just breathe a sigh of relief that, okay, it's going to be all right now. And member Yolanda Vasquez can relate. How long into your journey did you find the Facebook group? Uh, Around the third week of shedding. And I saw hundreds and thousands of women who have, who look like me, you know, uh, they're not all white, they're not all black, they're not all Asian. People as far as, you know, uh, Thailand, uh, posting pictures of their bald spots, of their thinning crowns, of everything that I was going through. And here they are in pictures where I can see. So I felt very encouraged by that. I'm sure you've seen my pictures on there. The change was really drastic and really sudden over a couple of weeks. And um, I felt that they knew exactly what I was going through. I'm very glad I found them. They, seeing other people with better conditions or better um, 
less loss than me was also encouraging um, because it let me know that maybe the severity of the sickness or the illness is what caused my, uh, my hair loss. And it lets me kind of verify to myself, yes, I did go through a big ordeal. Do you all celebrate each other's hair growth in the Facebook group? I do try to celebrate everybody's hair growth. When new people come in or just going through their hair loss, um, I try my best and I'm sure others do too, to let them know, hey, this is a journey. There is no magical formula. If you brush your hair, it's still going to fall out. If you don't brush your hair, it's still going to fall out. If you put your hair in braids, it's still going to fall out. If you have a mask of a hundred year old mayonnaise that you found, it's a family recipe. It's still going to fall out. Um, you know, don't waste your money on a lot of products right now, because in reality, it's still going to fall out. We're going to roll with the punches as much as we can. I think hair loss is serious for everybody. It affects everyone differently. That's it. I mean, other than that, it's just hair. I am now living my life, not, not less worried about my hair because I see it every day and I remember what it used to look like, but more, more glad that it, COVID didn't take me out. And until researchers figure a way to take COVID out, doctors warn that we're not out of the woods yet when it comes to COVID-19 infection and stress-related hair shedding. There's talk in the headlines that we might be looking at another surge. What words of advice would you have for people in terms of their hair? I think it's important to recognize that, yes, illnesses, if you, God forbid, do get sick um, with the actual uh, virus or other illnesses that are out there these days, it's important to remember that if you do experience this loss or shedding a few months later to bring it to your doctor's attention, there's not something you can necessarily do to prevent it. Um, it's a, just a matter of being one step ahead of the game and sort of, sort of understanding what could potentially occur and not letting it added stress impact it further. If someone starts noticing more hair on the floor, more hair in the drain, at what point should they make an appointment to see their doctor? I think at any point where they have concern about it. So we don't want to downplay um, the psychological effects that TE can have. And so anytime a patient is uncomfortable with what's going on, what's they're seeing, what they're seeing, they should absolutely reach out to their physician. It's always important to go ahead and make an appointment if you see something out of the range of normal for you. I definitely think hair loss is one of those things that not enough people come into their dermatologist to evaluate. Self-care is essential in these time periods, recognizing that this type of hair loss is by definition a reflection of how your body is perceiving a stress, whether it be the stress of having experienced psychological stress of what we went through during the early stages of the pandemic or an actual illness that your body went through it needs to recover. Recognizing that your body needs that time to recover is absolutely essential. Keeping a well rounded diet, trying not to crash diet and understanding that your body's looking for resources, nutrients, things to actually support the hair to grow. But when it comes to COVID-19 and hair loss, perhaps Lynn Traxler sums it up best. I've tried to focus on the fact that I'm alive. I am getting better and I can't cover up my hair, be it a ball cap, a wig, a, a hair piece, a scarf. Or I can do as some people and shave my head, which I don't think I'm going to do. But I think I, I applaud those that do. But just don't lose hope. It will come back. Just try not to panic. Know that there are, there are people that understand, that will be supportive, will be encouraging. And at some point, your hair will come back. Thank you for listening to this episode of Health Discovered from WebMD. I'm Kat Carney. Be well.